can see my screen? Is that true? Can you see a, a presentation screen that looks like me crossing my arms? Yes, yes we, we can, can see, see that. It. Okay, good. Um, so my name is Carrie Bernight, and um, my PhD in gerontology, the study of aging, um, is from USC, and I've been lucky enough to be in this field for 30 years. And today I thought that what we would talk about is can be summarized with aging brilliantly because we are right at the forefront of a new aging. Um, we are at a place where every day 10,000 more of us turn 75 and we have never in our history had this number of uh, humans going through aging, not only in just the United States, but globally. So did, did the slide change there? Perfect. Okay, so um, this new aging is really good news. And we are so bombarded by the multi-billion dollar anti-aging industry telling us that it is not good to get old, that actually the truth about aging has really, um, it's been hidden. And so I wanna take this time to share with you a lot of good news about aging. So the first has to do with our brains. And that is, uh, neurologically, there has never been a time in our adult lives that we've had such integration of the left and right hemisphere of our brains. And what integration of our brain hemispheres mean is greater problem solving. So if you were to look at a graph of problem solving ability over time, it is not a time of decline. In fact, it charts upward. And I think the best way to show you that is not to show you charts, but to tell you a story. This is a true story that focuses on my colleague's mother. Um, my colleague who unfortunately has passed away, Gene Cohen, he's an MD, PhD at Harvard in geriatric medicine. And his mother would um, every week have dinner at his home. And what she would do is she would take the subway back east and she would, it was on Tuesdays and she would get out of her um, subway and he would be there in his car, a dutiful son, and she would get into the car and they would drive off to his house for dinner and he would drive her home afterwards. She was in her 90s and it was before the time of ubiquitous cell phones. So she got out of her car on one day that was just dumping snow and when she got out of the subway and when she got out, he was running late at work. So she's standing there without a cell phone in the quite cold, pouring snow, problem solving. So what she did was she looked over and she saw that there was a pizza place. So she carefully walked over to the pizza place and said, I'd like to order a pizza for delivery. And when you take the pizza, I'd like to ride along in the car with you. And what an example that is of problem solving, right? So this reality of increased problem solving is not what we hear about. What we hear about is all the declines of aging, and yet research is showing us, and it is incumbent upon us to get the word out about the great things with aging. And if we could tap into the increased problem solving ability of older adults, a lot of these major issues that we are up against um, could be resolved. I have more good news. The next is that research shows that you become more you as you age. So show me an 18 month old and we know what he's doing. He's getting into everything, he's falling, he's doing all these things, but show me an 81 year old and even with the same socioeconomic status, the same health conditions, living in the same part of the country, the difference, the heterogeneity is staggering. So this is 81 and this is 81. And so in becoming more as we are, it, it matters very much about 
um, our ability to harness who it is we want to be. So the first half of life is what we call our resume characteristics. But our second 50, and I've just started into the second 50, is about our even obituary characteristics, or more positively stated, our true characteristics. So research now has been conducted on generosity, on love of learning, on humility, on strength, on resilience. And again, it is older adults who have the greatest trajectory upward because as we get older, we become more like ourselves and more close to the ideals that we've set out for ourselves. Um, I am so lucky to work with a lot of older adults and the resilience is truly humbling as is the spirituality, humor, perspective. And when we look at life satisfaction, life satisfaction also grows as we get older. And this is very much against what popular opinion is or what we're led to believe that it is only a time of decline. So what is in the way of aging our best life in terms of aging brilliantly? The first is ageism. So I recently had the opportunity to speak in front of 124 fourth graders. And I sat before the whole group and said, let's talk about aging. I'm a gerontologist. What happens when you get older? And in my mind, what was going to happen was that the children were going to raise their hands and we were going to talk about some different changes, like perhaps you got gray hair or maybe you retired from your job or you got to be a grandparent. But this is not at all what the children said. The children simultaneously raised their hands and I, I selected the boy in the front with his hand the highest and I said, okay, what happens when we get older? And the boy said quite proudly in front of everyone, you get ugly. I was like, oh, no, that is not what happens when you get older. Oh, my. So then I thought, I should really call upon a little girl. Maybe she would have something better to say. So as I looked out to, to pick who I was going to select, all the children were putting their hands down because that's what they were going to say. And the reason for it is this campaign that started the minute we were born that is very, very lucrative. And it sells makeups and cosmetics and gyms and all these things. And that message is that it is bad and ugly and defeatist to get older. And it is detrimental not only to a society, but to ourselves. Because really, if we really dig deep, we are ageist and the results are something that I see all the time. So uh, I think, unfortunately, I, I deleted that one, but um, the results are here in California. Unfortunately, we see it more often than perhaps other places. And that is people going to great lengths to try to do all these surgeries and all these kinds of things to stop aging and stopping aging is stopping living because aging is living and there is nothing more beautiful and attractive than embracing that yeah this is what 96 looks like this is how we're doing so when we think about aging brilliantly we can think about it in three areas the physical the cognitive and the social and they are equally important. And I think physical gets more of our interest and attention and media attention. But I think the other two are equally, if not more important. But like so many, I'll still start with physical health. So I had the opportunity recently to meet with this beautiful woman named Margaret, who at age 109 um, was living a brilliant life and what you can't see as clearly but in between the two of us is her 89 year old daughter so it was a mother and daughter who are living together and in a private residence and absolutely 
such wisdom and humor and I was just honored to have this opportunity. So when we look at physical health, we really need to be thinking about these four areas. And one is mobility. So it is common that as we get older, mobility is a, is a problem. And so at every age that we are, starting right now today with the people that we live with in each of the villages, with our colleagues, with ourselves, we need to be thinking how to maximize my ability to proactively get myself moving in a safe way because limitation, so what happens is we tear our meniscus, we have a hip replacement surgery, where our diabetic neuropathy is making it difficult to walk because we can't feel our feet. And so as a result, then we stop doing those things. And that is the snowball effect. So with the people that we're, we work with and with ourselves, we need to think, how can I absolutely maximize where I am now and to think I've got to keep moving? And if that is moving with a walker or a cane or in my wheelchair, or, but there isn't a way of, of stopping. Because if you stop, if we get into our comfortable chairs too much, um, it's going to bring down all the other areas. So I really can't say enough about keeping moving. And if you are lucky enough to, to be able to do the ideal triad, it is making sure that we're getting our heart beating, so cardio, making sure that we have a strength training component, and it doesn't mean you have to hit the gym, but it does mean some resistance, and it can be without weights, but making sure that we're keeping that strength and that we're doing that about three times a week. And then the last is flexibility. And flexibility is kind of the stepchild of mobility, but really, I, with a lot of my patients, the reason that they're walking with such pains is because of their contracted muscles. And where do you start? You just start with the littlest thing. So it could be starting in your chair and you're just reaching overhead. It looks like no big deal and it's not a big deal, but it can make all the difference in being able to keep mobile so thinking about lifting up your legs if you can if you're reaching down and you can only make it to your knees or not even down to your knees that's fine start right there and every day get a little bit farther but if you are not getting your heart going some and thinking about your strength and thinking about your flexibility you're not putting yourself on a path to age in the way that you can age the second is sleep Sleep is the bane of many of our existences. And a big trick for sleep is making sure that you're getting outside enough. So you're thinking, easy for you to say, Dr. California, what about me in the snow and in the rain? And what I would say is if it is possible with an umbrella, with your coat, however you can get outside because as humans, physiologically, our bodies are conditioned so that there are day rhythms and nighttime rhythms. So if you can, those who get outside sleep better. Those who are strict with themselves in terms of making the bedroom a place of sleep, that means not looking at our electronics in bed with that blue light. It means um, having a routine and sticking to it. And it means that even if you're gonna lie there for a while and not sleep, it can be a time of meditation and when your mind is spinning and spinning, telling yourself in a loving way as I see that your mind, you're active, you wish you were sleeping, but it's okay. I have a patient who is 89 and she always says, well, I don't sleep a lot, but I'm not dying from not sleeping. And so we always talk about at least she is trying and framing it in the way that being at least under the sheets with our eyes shut, thinking nice thoughts is something and then often can lead to a better sleep. The next is nutrition. It, the food we eat as we get older becomes more important 
rather than less important. So thinking about having a really big variety of colors that you're eating. I have a few patients who when I look through their colors, it's a piece of white toast in the morning, it's something white in the afternoon, and then some white noodles or mashed potatoes. It's not enough color. So so getting your color in, making sure you're eating enough good fat because good fats impact your brain and also your arthritis. So making sure that we're having enough salmon and omega-3 food. And the worst place to age, the most unsafe place for us is the hospital. So I wanna talk a little bit about staying out of the ER. I have a lot of patients that I work closely with who are unfortunately frequent flyers to the emergency room. And I see this too often. And I, there are a lot of reasons for getting into the ER, but I'm gonna talk about three biggies. Strokes, falls, and medications. Let's start with strokes. Many of you know this acronym of FAST, but I wanted to refresh our minds with it because every day we have hundreds and thousands of people having strokes. And the thing about strokes is that it is simply how fast you can get into treatment. It used to be that you'd had a stroke and we didn't have, we didn't have the ability to do these effective treatments that can regain what was lost from having the blood extravate in the brain. So if you or anyone you love is noticing some facial drooping, some weakness in either of your arms, they're just feeling different, some slurring and speech difficulty, it could be from drooping or it could just be finding the words or substituting words in an unusual way, it's time to call 911. And I know I said earlier that I want you to get, stay out of the hospital, but if you're having a stroke or even think there's an even little chance that you're having a stroke, I want you to get in there right away. So there's a three hour window, but it's the faster, the better. And what if you're wrong? What if you actually like, eh, no, I just think, like I had a patient who was taking muscle relaxants. And he, so he was saying, um, I, I think that I'm feeling a little woozy because of these muscle relaxants. And so I said, you know what? What's the harm in going in except for it's, it's kind of a hassle? But he did, and it was. In his case, it was a bilateral brain hemorrhage. And the way that it came, he was actually toasting with a margarita, and the margarita was tipping, and he was spilling. And then also in his toast, he was substituting words. And then happily, the couple that they, this couple was with, she was a nurse and said, I think you need to reach out. And then he called and then got to the ER. So um, if we have questions later on, we can talk about this. But um, strokes are hard to avoid, although the exercise and eating well and sleeping well are always to postpone or get away from them. If it does happen, we have something that you can do about it. So when in doubt, go get medical care. Okay, the next biggie that I wanna talk about is medications. So this photo here is the insert there, are the actual medications that a patient of mine was um, brought in in a brown bag. Here's the problem. Every medication that you take impacts you, not just what it was prescribed for, but for other reasons. So many cause confusion, many cause sleep interruptions, many cause dry mouth that, that impacts speech. And so if you can take the opportunity with older adults that you work with to say every medication why am I taking this? Who prescribed it? And who's the quarterback on all these medications? So in an ideal world, your primary care doctor or your internist, or ideally your geriatrician, so you know a geriatrician is an MD who is a corollary to the pediatrician. So if one person knows that your cardiologist 
is prescribing these very important medications and your urologist is prescribing these and your oncologist is prescribing these and your gastroenterologist, not to mention topicals, so lotion-like um, medications and medications that aren't even prescriptions. So a lot of times we wanna do the best and we read an article about something that is great for us and then we go to the store and we buy it those interact with medications too. So really good physicians take people off more medications than they put them on. And just because you've been on one medication regime for a long time doesn't mean it's safe because our bodies stop processing medications as they did. So I, for example, have hypothyroidism as many people do, and I've been on a certain dosage of my um, Synthroid, but over time, my body is changing and how it can process it. So we need to be able to proactively have these conversations with doctors to say, I'm bringing in my medications. This is how I'm taking it. I'm not sure that any of these are for sure right. And do any of these interact with each other? I had a patient who was not this patient here, but a different lady, and she was really getting confused. And so her adult children said, we think she has dementia, and they gave examples why they thought she had dementia. We had her bring in her medications. <coughs> Sorry for my dog. We had her bring her medications in, and one of them was cannabis, but she didn't know that. And so she was really, really stoned a lot of the time in her 90s, and nobody knew how it was that she was ever prescribed cannabis to begin with. And so you start thinking, wow, let's take a look at what is going on here. And expired medications, people want to hold on to them, understandably, because they have spent their good money and they think, well, maybe I'll need these some days. But I just see all too often that people, they get mixed back in with what people are taking or they go to multiple pharmacies and multiple pharmacies are refilling things, particularly when you get out of the hospital. So you'll go and pick up the, med the new medication, but then there'll be three others there. And if you're not incredibly sharp, which none of us are after we get out of the hospital, you're taking things that you were never intended for you. So I could talk for a long time about medications, but, um, Less is more, and know why you're taking them. Okay, so then the other area I want to talk about is falls, and that is linked to medication, that a lot of these medications are making us dizzy and unsteady on our feet. And the traditional way with falls has been quite um, reactive, right? You just wait till somebody falls, and then you go do something about it. Well, by that time, they have a broken hip, They've had to have a stay in a skilled nursing facility. So with falls, it's important to think every 19 minutes, somebody dies from a fall in the U.S. So we're, we're just, we are, we are falling like crazy. <laughs> and I, I'm even starting to notice that my feet feel less sturdy on the stairs when I'm going down. So again, proactively thinking that the way you used to do it is not the way we're going to do it going forward. Every single time holding on to the railing, no matter what, even if you're feeling great, you've got to hold the railing. You've got to proactively put in bars in, in your homes, in the tubs or in the showers and next to the toilet. You've got to have a well-lit way. You've got to think about wires and cords. If you just leave it to chance, you will fall. If you fall, you will lose the independence that we all crave and deserve. So let's move from the physical to the cognitive. So Mary, Mary yes? Can you sh do present mode so we can see the slide big? Oh. <laughs> Perfect, thank you. This whole time I thought I was. Thank you. I didn't know you could hear me, but I'm glad that you can. So now we can see the big slide. Thank you. Okay. So let's talk about, is that better for people, Carolyn? 
Yes. <laughs> okay. So <laughs> let's talk about cognitive health. I think there are so many misunderstandings here. And that is that we have kind of dichotomized it. So it's as if either you're fine or you have dementia. There's just these two areas. But in fact, it is the most gray area of the world. And I don't mean that as a pun that, but gray matter is actually quite a good pun there. So when we think about cognition and how our mind works, these are the four areas that I think about. One is memory, and that's, what pe that's the area that people think about the most. But memory is really interesting, right? Because where it is physiologically stored is quite different. So new memories are stored in a different area, and that's what, when we have cognitive impairment, that's what goes first. That's the reason that some of these things that used to be easier for us get to be a challenge. It doesn't mean we have dementia. It means there are some cognitive changes with aging. Often, as we said, memory is impacted by the saliency, that is how important something is to you. So if it's not that important, you're not gonna remember it that much. And so, you know, that's something you can let people know. If your adult daughter, if your 50 year old daughter is saying to you at 90, like, can't believe you're not memorized, didn't remember this. It's sometimes okay to say, I didn't remember it. And it's because that's not that important to me. <laughs> and it's not because I have dementia. So it's okay that sometimes every, throughout life, we don't remember everything. And that is perfectly fine. Executive function is the ability to go, okay, first I need to do this, and then I do this. So it is something that high school boys, for example, don't have much executive function. And what I found, I didn't tell you, but I worked for 17 years in elder abuse. So all, all I did was see cases of people who have endured um, financial, physical exploitation and neglect. And exec changes in executive function were common with, are common with older adults and can be very problematic because if we're not able to do all the steps of, okay, with my bill, I need to get it and get the stamp and get, the, get it recorded in my checkbook and then get it into the mail, it is a potential for problems. So when we see changes in our mm -hmm. own executive functioning or the executive functioning of other people, it is something to, to kind of think, okay, there may be changes in this area. How can we proactively make changes so that this doesn't ultimately lead to the problem? Because in the past, what most people do is they wait till the bills don't get paid. They wait till the older adult gets scammed. They wait till there's not enough food in the refrigerator because a person couldn't get the steps together to do it. Which brings me to my next area, and that is awareness. The irony of cognition is that the very thing that is of issue, that is our brains, sometimes we're not aware that there are changes. And that is where the, that's kind of where the problem is, because we're maybe having changes in memory that are impacting our ability to carry out our activities of daily living, our executive functioning seems to have changes, but we're not aware that there are problems. And that's why being connected with others and again, being proactive to say, ah, the odds are if I live long enough, I'm gonna have changes to these areas. And when I do, I wanna have people in my life who together can let me know that, yeah, it does seem like this is getting to be harder. What are some solutions that we can do? But if our head is down and that we're always just gonna have perfect cognition for our whole life, we're not going to be able to. So I had uh, one patient who is a retired university professor and she wrote a note to her future self. And she said, dear Professor Smith, there will be a time where I'm not going to be able to, and she wrote different things. And when that happens, I trust my daughter is going to let me know. And even if I deny it, so she, like, I love that kind of proactive thinking and that there's not a shame in it, right? We know that we're not our bodies, but we're also not just our brains. We're so much more than that. And investing in that, which is not our brain and not our body, 
again, investing in our wisdom and generosity, spirituality, appreciation of beauty, um, humility, those things remain even when we have changes in cognition. And so then what the cognitive changes bring us to is often security issues. So there's a part of the brain called the ventromedial prefrontal cortex. And there have been studies to show that that part of the brain is, um, among other things, responsible for determining whether something is credible. Or conversely, that part of the brain impacts credulity and gullibility. So you can be cognitively intact. You're going about things doing just fine. But because of imperceptible changes to the ventromedial prefrontal cortex, you are more likely to believe when a scammer reaches out to you, you are more likely to think, oh, I did win the lottery. Ah, I am going to be able to donate to this cause that this person is asking me for. So I have a lot of adult children of seniors say, I've told her over and over that this is, I can't, she just doesn't listen to me. This is a scam. Well, there are reasons for it. And so I'll say to that adult daughter, guess what? If you're lucky enough, you're going to live to your mom's age and be 95. And at that time, it will be harder for you too to differentiate scams versus real people, like really good people versus people who are trying to separate you from your money. So I think just an understanding of the security risk that accompany cognitive health and taking a proactive approach saying, yep, I'm going to have changes in my body and I am going to have changes in my brain. And that doesn't mean I'm less than or defeated or ashamed. That is aging. That is living. <laughs> That is my dog. So the problem with the proactive approach is that uh, the problem with the reactive approach is that if we just wait like 90% of people do and they're just by themselves aging like no news is good news, what happens ultimately is that something goes wrong and then you as the adult daughter get the call. We know that call. Sometimes it calls in the middle of the night. Sometimes it's first thing in the morning, but it's like, <gasps> dad is not okay. And then what that call triggers is not that. When it's on full screen, something happens. What that call triggers is calls and calls and calls and group texts and what are we going to do and sibling discord about what should be done. And what often gets left out is the most important player, and that is the older adult who should be the decision maker about his or her own life. And so again, this is a pitch. For all of us, if we're going to age brilliantly, we need to be proactive. That is, we're calling the shots with our well-intended loving adult kids and grandkids that when these things happen, this is what we want. When we need care, this is the kind of care we want. We want to stay in our home we want to, or we want to move somewhere. We want somebody to come into the home like a caregiver we want to try to use technology to address some of these issues, but by being proactive, we can avoid, avoid other people just making the decisions for us. And this is what I liken it to. I liken it to the reactive approach is what I see day in and day out, which is the water is aging. Aging can be glorious, but it can also get cold and choppy and tough. So with the reactive approach, I, as my 95 year old self, fall into the water, everybody goes crazy, we all get attention, like, ah, and we throw this life raft in. I would implore us to attempt to structure our brilliant aging with the proactive approach. That is recognizing that the aging water will get tough. We will have cognitive changes. We will have cancer and broken hips and problems will come our way with the water. But by putting in place beforehand 
our village support, our family members, who, what caregivers we would like, what we will do when we are, um, are having a hard time paying our bills, what we will do when we can't see. Half of us will, will have serious visual impairments, and I'm gonna be in that group because I already have had a retinal detachment. Half of us will not be able to hear, and that really cuts you off from the world. And half of us, after age 95, will be living with cognitive impairment. So let's choose the proactive side. So to review, let's talk about the traditional way versus the brilliant way. Traditionally, we're reactive. We get scammed and we're lonely. 43% of adults age 65 and older identify as lonely as defined by wanting more social interaction than you currently have. The new way, the way that the village, is, village to village network is changing the world, Casey, is the proactive way. And that is safe because we've planned, connected, because we know the value of connection. And I'm gonna talk much more about that. So I'd like to next introduce you to, oh, I forgot, I'm jumping ahead. So we've talked about physical, we've talked about cognitive, and now let's talk about social. Social could be called like the emotional area, it could be called the spiritual, area but i like to call it the social area because we are social beings whether or not we're willing to admit it so there are social risk indicators and one is loneliness that is really an area that i've dedicated my life's research to so i'm going to talk the most about it then there is depression which is you know finally getting the attention it deserves because it is very <coughs> about 15% of us will be living with depression and similarly 15% of us will be living or 20% will be living with anxiety that feeling that like something is wrong and that we can't quite get settled and it's just the worst feeling ever so when we go now to loneliness chronic loneliness is deadly it is causing us with all variables held constant to have almost 30% increase in coronary artery disease. And it's a result of inflammation. Being lonely, that is more social interaction. So I don't want to confuse it with alone. You can be alone and not be lonely. You can be in a crowded room and be lonely. So remember, the definition is wanting more social interaction than you currently have. And again, 43% of people in a big national study said that after 65, they would like more interaction than they currently have. 32% increased risk in stroke, again, because of inflammation, which causes differences in blood pressure. And then um, as the blood runs through our um, blood vessels in our brains that's the impact on stroke and then the biggie the one that makes me want to fall off my chair and faint every time i see it is the 64 percent increase in developing dementia can you imagine if there was anything else that was as big of an impact on our aging as on dementia if it, was, if it was something in the air or something in the water, we would all go crazy, but it's something that is right in front of us and something that we can do something about. And all variables held constant again. Those who were chronically lonely had a 26% increase in death, in dying. So we are literally dying. And what people will say, I don't really, I'm one of those people that doesn't really need you know, much social connection. Maybe. When people tell me they don't need any, that's like saying, I'm one of those people who just doesn't need to eat. I'm one of those people who just really doesn't need to sleep. We all need to be connected. And one of the most amazing things is a study that showed 
that loneliness is the same health hazard as smoking 15 cigarettes a day. A bigger health hazard than obesity and smoking. Can you imagine such a thing? And it's starting to get more and more recognized in the media, in the Wall Street Journal, in Time Magazine. And it was a, one of the big topics at the World Economic Forum in Davos, both this year and last year. So we're making headway and the wonderful work that Village to Village Network does is promoting that. So now it is time for a story. And this is to introduce you to someone I had the absolute pleasure of working with. His name is Harry. And he not only allowed me to share his story, but he encouraged me to. Here he was, um, he was a Green Beret. He attended Stanford University. He cared for his wife with her journey with Alzheimer's disease for 10 years. And this is the day that I met Harry. So I, at the time, was director of the Elder Abuse Forensic Center. And Harry had been admitted to the hospital as a result of dehydration and malnutrition. and. <clears throat> Many times, without peeling back the onion, you would think, well, it's just that. He's in his 80s, and he's dehydrated, and he's malnourished. But if you take a step further, why was he malnourished and dehydrated? This is why. Harry was lonely. He lived in his big, nice home, and on his landline and on his computer, he got on the list, as so many of us do, for scam artists. And they would call him and say, Harry, we are so grateful for your help. We are coming together to raise money to support veterans. I know you're a veteran. Can you help us with this effort? And Harry said, absolutely. I would love to. They called him. They got so they called him every day. They were his very... They were his friends. They called a lot more than his family members. So Harry, in the course of 16 months, was scammed out of nearly $600,000. He lost his home and he was utterly alone and financial exploitation is big business in our country. Every year, we're losing $37 billion to financial exploitation. And it is not just a financial issue, it is primarily a physical issue. Because what happens when we don't have the money to pay for our care is that we are going without care. So I wanted to talk to you about, sometimes my, sometimes my slides don't advance. There, okay. Good, I want to end with good news, and this is how Harry got his groove back. This picture was taken after the first picture. So this picture of Harry, also in his 80s, was after he got reconnected back into the world. And in his case, it was standard technology that had allowed perpetrators to reach him. It was through his computer, it was from his landline, and it was also through the mail. <clears throat> um, so it's just a delayed reaction. So you press it and then you just wait a little while. Okay, through traditional technology, it had been a problem for Harry because what I call poofs. Anybody know what poofs are? Points of frustration. So with standard technology, that we have, it's rough to get internet connection. It is rough because there are so many passwords. We have to plug things into little tiny holes. We have to make sure they're charged all the time. The font is tiny, the screens are tiny, and they were designed for 20 and 30 year olds. So that's where my two worlds collided, and that is I was running uh, Elder Abuse Forensic Center, and I knew and I was studying loneliness, and we did a big study in the Journal of the American Geriatric Society, and we found that one of the greatest risk factors for exploitation was loneliness. 
So I've been on a mission to improve the lives of millions of seniors by reconnecting them with their families, friends, and caregivers. So I was lucky enough to meet somebody on the same mission. And so this is my colleague, Scott Lean. He was the chief information officer at Bank of America for his career. When he retired, he was frustrated that he wasn't able to reach his mom. This is not his mom, but he wasn't able to reach his mom who lived in Iowa because when he set up the um, tablet, the iPad, there were all these hurdles that, hit, that were making it frustrating for his mom. So he got on the same mission as to create technology that would connect humans. And this beautiful picture is 114 year old Anna who lived in her home on her own and taught us what, it, what <clears throat> somebody at 114 would want out of a way to connect and most importantly, what she didn't want. Whoops, so what she wanted was a fresh, a tart. <laughs> she wanted a fresh start. And so she wanted that the device itself would be no setup, like no things to get going. She wanted it to be wireless so she didn't have to plug in. She wanted it when you opened it, it would turn right on. It would have a case included, a stylus for those of us who have arthritic conditions. She wanted software that didn't have any passwords, that was intuitive and elegant that you didn't have to figure stuff out. And most of all, what we learned from Anna is that she wanted humans to help her. She didn't want to press one for this, press two for that, hold on a line. She wanted internet connection that was just everywhere so she could take her device to the doctor's office. And she wanted to be treated fairly. And what isn't fair with traditional kinds of devices is that we get locked into a contract or that we, if we drop it or lose it, which we all do, that we'd have to pay for it again. So we designed it so there's not a contract for this device and that there is, if you break it or lose it, we just send you a new one. So we had, this is Harry again, and we have a 90-90 principle. So that a 90-year-old needs to be able to connect with other humans in 90 seconds. So we came up with this grand pad and this is just one solution. And, you know, my goal is like, I can't not share the grand pad when I give talks because I see it working every day. But I also want you guys to know that there's many ways to connect. And in fact, my favorite way to connect is what you're already doing, which is putting humans together in real life in person. That's the best way, human to human. But because many of us live at great distances and many of us aren't able to get out from our home because of physical mobility limitations, um, this is something that we've come up with and we're, we're real proud of. So with this grand pad, you could touch this green button to make a call. And what would happen would be, you would get a screen that looked like this. You press a button for your son, Scott, and you can then choose if you want it to be a video call going to Scott's phone or you would like it to be um, just a phone call. And so on the one end, the older adult has the grand pad and on the other side, they have their standard device, whether it's their phone or whatever they prefer. So connecting the humans was the reason, the reason for, for being, but also while we were at it, we were like, oh my gosh, there is such an incredible value of music. There is no drug that impacts our cognition as beneficially as music. So we were able to load 30 million songs onto the gram pad and that without having to have a password or pay extra money, you could have the songs that have meaning for you. We could put all the games on that older adults requested that these are all the kinds of things I'd like to be able to do. The weather, I'd like to check not only my weather, but weather of all the family members that I'm connected to. So I wanna give a little story about a beautiful woman that I get to work with whose name is Althea. And this is Althea on her wedding day. 
and this is Althea these days. And Althea has advanced Alzheimer's disease. And so the tablet has been a life changer for her. And so this was, um, Althea is now nonverbal and generally quite contracted, meaning like her head and is bent down. And so her daughter had felt like she was, quote, unreachable. So we asked her, what are her favorite songs from when she was younger? And so her daughter did some good thinking and then came up with it was actually hymns or what Althea was very spiritual and she sang in her church. And so we were able to find those hymns because with 30 million songs, you can easily find them. And then when we played them, she not only listened, but she sang the words. And so she's still in all the neurofibrillary plaques and tangles associated with Alzheimer's disease. Emotions are stored in a certain part of the brain. So if you can touch on things that have emotional salience, you can reach through the tangles of Alzheimer's disease. And so every day her family, and then they were nice enough to let me in on it, um, would hear her sing these songs. And with that stimulation, there was what we call a halo effect, is that afterwards she would had a window where she could um, say a few words. And so the word that uh, Althea always said after this was lovely. So on this particular day, and if I had any brains at all, I would have pressed video instead of um, camera, because what she said was, lovely, lovely, lovely. She like said it about 40 or 50 times. So it makes me really proud to be able to um, work with Village to Village Network and with older adults across the nation. And in fact, globally, we've really now ha um, have offices in Ireland in order to connect the world in a way that's going to enable us to age brilliantly that is based on dignity, on individual choice, on autonomy, and on the eradication of ageism. And the eradication of ageism is only gonna come from older adults. So 20 year olds don't have the sophistication or the wisdom or the brain power to go like, oh yeah, it is. It has to come from like, when I'm a 90 year old, I need to say, yeah, this is what 90 looks like. I'm not apologizing for it. I don't, yeah, I don't know all the latest gadgets and gizmos. And I, 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 am, I am leading the way. So I'm just so grateful to what Village to Village Network is doing to promote this countercultural revolution of aging. And I wanted to open it up now if anybody had any questions um, or any areas that we didn't cover that you would like to talk cover because we have do 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 <laughs> a big whopping three minutes to really dig in. <laughs> unmute yourselves. Can you find the unmute button up here? If you like, go up. This is Mara Hoffman, and I'm in Albuquerque, New Mexico. Hi, Mara. And we have just uh, created our village um, end of January, and it took two years. And that two years was marvelous because it got me out my front door, meeting some people right in the immediate neighborhood. And it's been a big plus in that way. So... Um, I am delighted. And that really, that is what is changing the world. It's mm -hmm. like people yeah. getting out, connecting, and helping other people in a meaningful way. So that's just wonderful. I'm so finding glad other, that you're doing that. Finding others such as myself that are as enthusiastic about that. Yeah. Ha, terrific. Yeah. That is so great. And what do you guys think about webinars as a way to connect? I, you know, like, I, I think there's a lot of promise to it, but I also think that we can do a better job making it more interactive because it's hard to just sit and listen. So I was thinking maybe if we did another webinar, we would have a way to make it bounce around a little bit more so we could all be sharing our wisdom and humor. 
Could I add one more thing? Oh, um, I hope you do. <laughs> this is Mara again, a caveat. The reason that it, um, you're not seeing my image today is that I had some uh, surgery uh, a week ago. So I'm covered with Aquaphor, which is like Vaseline. And um, I thought I would just talk today. But yeah, also, I understand. Also how important it is that I can connect with this webinar. That is so great. Or not. Yes. How, can, how should we get the word out about webinars more? Like today there was a big technical issue and that is that the publicity set a different time than the speakers knew. Um, but, uh, you know, is that like getting the word out about connecting people through webinars? Do you guys have ideas of how we could get the word out? Well, just that all of us hear how effective they are and we share that. Yes. Okay. And what topics would be helpful for people? What topics would people be interested in? Well, Dr. Carey, this is Margaret Horst. I'm uh, in a village in an active adult community in Cary, North Carolina. Ah. Um, yes, we would be interested in practical solutions to to some of these issues you know you you've identified uh, a lot of the the factors that we need to be thinking about but um i'd be interested in what you might suggest for practical ways to go about addressing these issues yes um i think the best way is for people to to submit what the you know what the issue is and then we can tackle it because I got a lot, I got a lot more where that came from. And it's, <laughs> it's from older adults doing it successfully. You know, like I've been so lucky to, you know, have 30 years of learning from seniors who have aged brilliantly um, about things that work. So I'd love to do that, Margaret. Yeah. One of the things that always impresses me is, you know, we, we seniors have a bad rap that we can't deal with technology and uh, with the, the new things. And yeah, so I find people who are confused, but you know, this grand pad, it's a great idea. It's a great concept. Keep it simple. Keep it, you know, focused on the things that we want to, that we want to attack. That's if, there's right. a way, if there's a way to do webinars with grand pad, that would be wonderful. Absolutely, and that's exactly what we're adding the functionality. We don't yet, but we want to enable it um, to on you right now. You can talk one on one all day long, but we want to have it where you can talk to multiple people at the same time because then we'll have groups that can gather together. And the thing about, and you guys can be ambassadors for this, it's, it's not because older adults need anything that is dumbed down or like simple. It's the opposite. It's that um, Leonardo da Vinci said that simplicity is the greatest sophistication. So we, as we're getting older, we want things that are sophisticated that don't have stupid things to waste our time. <laughs> so I don't want to read a lot of directions in small print and stupid things that I don't, you know, I don't want 25 million buttons on my remote control. I just want to change the channels, you know? So uh, the grand hat has gone with that. And it's only because we have listened that like we employ, uh, we have at least 12 older adults who are ages 85 to 104 who are guiding what we do, right? The wisdom comes from those who are walking it right now. So uh, I like your point a lot. Does I anybody have else question. have any questions? I have a question about that grand pad. Oh, sure, Jerry. Is that accessible? It doesn't have speech. Does it have, you know, for low vision people, myself, I'm not able to see. So everything I have has to be accessible. Uh, it's a great question. Yes. So... Hello? No, I'm just kidding, not somebody else's phone. <laughs> so, um, okay, so I'll start with hearing impairment. So what we did, for example, is that when you press a button to make a video call, it helps because we can read lips, but it didn't help enough. So we also have what we call real-time texting during the video call. 
So when I am talking to my mom who lives with hearing impairment, I type in on my phone, I'm coming to visit you in October. October. And if she thinks it says November, I type in the word October. So that every step of the way, we can empower people to live with the different impairments we're gonna have. Now in terms of vision, everything is really big and one of our advisors is entirely blind. And so we're still working on the ability to, for those who haven't any vision, <coughs> it's still a challenge. If you have some low vision as I did when my retina is detached, because they were big, because of the contrast, I was able to at least get the buttons that I needed to. And it's a secure network. So only people that can reach me on my grandpad is those that I have selected so that scammers can't get in to reach me. And then at any time I can press one of the buttons and it gets to a human who I've been assigned and all our human live in Iowa and Minnesota, particularly for the Minnesota nice. And so with adults that I work with who have very low vision, um, you could just press, if you can get to the one button that is a human, you can then just say to the human, hey, I want to be able to call so-and-so, can you help me with that? Or I even have some folks who, we have a, a daily um, Bible verse of the day for those who opt into that, and she could no longer read it. And so then the human would every day read it to her because um, I think technology is only good if it's like intended to connect humans. Any other I questions or concerns? Barbara, let me see you. Okay, hi. I turned me, myself on. I had my picture on. Thank you so much for coming. Yeah, yeah stop screen share. No, I'm bigger. Oh, there you go. <laughs> um, you asked about um, something which I think is really important for a lot of our villages, how to be more interactive with the webinar. And, and I'm not saying that we're hiring you as a consultant, but I'm saying that we have, we have a webinar, it's called Frail Members, and villagers get on and talk about challenges the villages have. You know, what do I do? I have a, a villager who has dementia. What are some of the alternative things I can do for them? Um, you know, or Alzheimer's. You know, Jerry mentioning, you know, challenges with visual. An interactive webinar is always a very popular way for speakers to get some points across because everybody on here is part of a village and and a lot of them are you know helping others so um finding solutions for their challenges is part of what i think our webinars are designed for does that make sense absolutely i think that i mean and what a great way to together um wrestle with these issues that we all have yeah, I love the sound of that. Okay. Well, thank you so much. So if you anybody needs to contact me for these kinds of opportunities, I think there are many ways to connect, but I think probably just reaching out to me, it's um, Carrie, K-E-R-R-Y, at grandpad.net. And I also have resources um, I've been doing some kind of media type of things. And so I have a website that's called drcarriebernight.com. So if you just wanted to go on the website, we'll be posting these kinds of clips on there. All right, I think we're just about at the top of the hour. I appreciate the time that y'all took today and um, look forward to doing something like this again. Thank you, Travis, for setting Thank it up. Thank you, Dr. Carey. We're, we really appreciate you speaking today. And if anybody wants to uh, uh, see this video at a later time, I, I will post that on our YouTube channel and I'll send out a notification when it is posted. So um, thanks a lot. Perfect. And um, email me with things. Oh, like I really like this is a topic like, for example, like let's say it was 
resisting help when you need help and that would be a you know like what topics would be really super of interest targeted to your village um, and then we can see what we can hook up with that perfect thanks so much we really appreciate it all right have a great day hey, thanks thank bye-bye bye thank you